In this episode, I'm going to be driving the two bookends of the Land Rover Defender family. This, arguably the most practical, the plug-in hybrid, and then the most extreme, most expensive Defender, the V8. I'm Johnny Smith, welcome to The Late Break Show. So as I said at the start, this is a sort of bookend of the Defender family. Because this is the plug-in hybrid, that means there's an electric motor that runs on the back axle down there. The batteries are somewhere underneath the passenger compartment. Uh, 19 and a half kilowatt hour battery pack. Under here is a two litre turbo Ingenium, as they call it, petrol engine. You can still buy a diesel um, or a straight petrol car with a mild hybrid actually with the diesels. Um, but I'm not gonna focus on those. I'm focusing on big V8 and big power hybrid. P400, this is called P400 because this is nearly 400 horsepower. I think it's 397 brake horsepower. It's a huge amount actually, and not only that, it's 472 pounds feet of torque, so it's, it's a lot. And you can go off-road, electric only, using a low ratio um, transmission system. So it can do genuine rock crawling, slow speed, off-road, E only. Several things that I have to mention straight away, which could break the deal for some people. First and foremost, the WLTP range of this car in electric only is 27 miles. Real world, probably a smidge over 20 miles. If you order it as plug-in hybrid, you cannot buy it as the three door, the, the Defender 90. It has to be this, the 110, the five door. You cannot order the commercial version of the Defender as a FEV, just so you know. A car like this, I think you buy to do a lot of towing with. If that's the case, bear in mind you can tow three tons with the FEV, not three and a half tons like you can the regular DEF. Bear all of those things in mind before you think about pulling the trigger or getting crazy on the configurator for the FEV. By the way, it starts at 63,000 pounds, which sounds an awful lot. It's actually a little bit cheaper than the equivalent BMW X5. And the equivalent X5 hybrid also cannot be bought as a seven seater. So as soon as you set off in the uh, Defender FEV, it defaults to hybrid mode, which means it uses a combination of the electric motor back there and the engine at the front, the Ingenium two litre petrol turbo. What you can do is this button here, which is actually quite hidden amongst the kind of hill descent and off-roady stuff. It says EV and it brings up on the dashboard three options, save, hybrid and EV. Now save is when you've charged the battery up, you can hold it for when you say go into cities. So right now, for example, I've got it in save. It's only using the engine and I can then choose when to use that power and I like that. It mostly makes sense if you're going into congestion like a city or a town and doing lots of that stuff. It also is worth bearing in mind that the EV only element of a car like this isn't great at high speeds. So it's not really a sort of thing you'd use on a dual carriageway or a motorway. Press it again and you can go into EV mode and it will work in EV mode up to 85 miles an hour which is really good. The WLTP range is 27 miles. It's not brilliant. In the real world, I've, I've found it, I've had it now for two days, I found it to be about 20 miles, okay? Unless you absolutely hypermile it. Now, 20 miles sounds useless to a lot of people. I don't necessarily agree with that. I think 20 miles is actually, you can use that quite well for, for, for school runs and short journeys around towns and stuff and if you can charge at home it makes absolute sense but anyway i've got it in hybrid mode and really it depends on your throttle position of what happens with the engine and what happens with the battery right now i'm on the battery on the right hand side of the um the gauge cluster it says um, my battery state of charge on the left hand is my fuel uh, left gauge is speed right gauge is rpm and it tells you if you regen braking so the needle swings into the green when i do regen braking and blue for the amount of electric energy I've used. Having driven this now for a couple of hundred miles, it's a very ego massaging, pleasant, stately, special feeling car to drive. 
What I like about the Defender is on the outside, you can spec it to be a bit too fussy. Inside, I think they've really got the balance between buttons, tech, and letting the design and the textiles breathe. Now I'm coming into the town. You could, I mean, the, the, I'm, in, I'm in the default hybrid mode already, but I'll stick it in EV mode with that button. There we go. And I can bring up on the dashboard here, I can bring up my eco data like this, and it'll give me my driving style, my energy impact, my eco tips and the history of my driving, how much fuel I've used, which is the blue, and how much electricity I've used, which is the green. So while I'm cruising through town on e-only energy, which is great to see a car like this that's so rugged and so iconic, traveling in total silence. I do really like that. You can um, go into the eco menu and we can talk about things like the, um, the EV-ness. Press EV and it will instantly give you um, the range combined with the petrol and the, the plug-in battery power and the battery's about there under the uh, boot floor. Um, and then there's the E only range, which is six, 16 miles right now. I would have liked Land Rover to have got a little bit more range out of the FEV, only because it's peers, something like the X5 BMW, um, the 45, that will do 50 miles, just over 50 miles um, WLT electric only. Now we're coming into a, um, a well-heeled market town where there's of course a Defender and then there's of course a Disco 5 and that leads me to one of my other question marks. Why didn't Land Rover call this the Discovery 6? I just think that this should have been badged as, as a Disco 6 with Defender-ish style and then they would have left themselves the chance to have made a Defender Defender, a rugged, um, cheaper, more utilitarian car, perhaps more basic, um, at a later date. That's just my personal view. I think somewhere around here, you might be able to see that it comes with a full-size spare wheel and tyre. None of this like can of spray or compressor, a real spare wheel. And I suspect that's the reason why there's a camera in there instead of a normal mirror. I think so anyway. That gives you a good 180 degree view. The back door, solenoid release, side opening, like a chimney. 853 litre boot, so it is slightly smaller than a non-FEV and you can see there's that ridge there and that's what gives away this as a plug-in hybrid rather than a non. I don't mind though, still tons of space, especially if you take away this really weird canvassy, I think quite pointless parcel shelf thing. Take that away and you've got a great space. Uh, you, can, you can drop the seats individually and you've got the lovely skylights like the traditional death. But this is the bit that a lot of people buy it for. It's dog friendly, it's very, very useful for a myriad of things. You've even got a little load tray in there. But this is the critical element of this car's feature. This is the, uh, the fuel flap is on the other side. This is the plug-in hybrid bit. Open this door. The first thing you're greeted with, interestingly, is the option of rapid charging. Yes, this can rapid charge DC, CCS, up to 50 kilowatts, which is weird given that it's quite a small range, small battery car. And the BMW rival, and I think the um, Volvo rivals can't do that yet they've got a bigger battery for more range. So yeah, like the Volvo XC60 recharge will do 49 miles. XC90 recharge will do 42 WLTP and the BMW X5 will do over 50 miles EV only. So this loses as an EV to those cars, but you can rapid charge it and that's as standard. So what are the stats? Well, obviously if you charge it at home, with your 7.4 kilowatt wall box, that'll do it in a shade over two hours. If you do it with a three pin, 
the sort of thing that car comes with as standard, that's seven hours charge, but in half an hour, zero to 80% with that rapid charge. So on the one hand, you could look at this as going, well, it's just a bit too low a range. On the other hand, you go, in the real world, where will 20 and a bit miles get me? How many little journeys will that do? And it will really offset that big engine at the front and the fact that this is a brick that's two and a half tons. One thing I think is really important to mention is the plug-in hybrid um, Defender has a six year, 60,000 mile warranty, which does bode really well. And the other thing for me is, it's not the kind of car that you care about the fact that it's adding weight to. It just doesn't really seem to matter. And the other thing is it's very discreet. It's just that, and it's just that little badge. Where is it? Here it is. That little badge there, P400E, that's it. It's half the price of the V8 too, which, you know, is worth considering. This is really why you would buy a car like a Land Rover, unless you just want the sort of lifestyle and the badge. And that's because it is massively capable off-road. And although I'm not gonna go off-road in this feature because I know it is massively capable, I thought I'd drive it in normal road going conditions. There's no doubt that this is where your money is going. The fact that you can lock diffs, the fact that you, you've got um, cameras that seem to be looking through the bonnet, your wading depth, the ability to be able to descend easily. It's sort of idiot proof and it allows you to do everything. You can drive low range, EV only, up, to, and you can drive up to 85 miles, um, miles an hour, EV only. So there's a lot to appreciate here. And this eight speed ZF gearbox is the same as the one that's in all the other normal piston defs. And it's a great gearbox, I have to say. I like the modulation between EV and, and piston engine. It seems to be pretty smooth and the controls are quite tight uh, and they're a little bit more responsive than you expect from such a bulky, huge thing. Loads of USBs. Everywhere I look, I see USBs and rubberized flooring, which I do like. I think it's even rubberized down there. Yeah, it is. Do you know, I've found the steering to be really quite responsive given the, the dimensions of this car. And talking of dimensions, instead of me saying them on screen, I'm not gonna tell you the dimensions because I've realized you can go into an option on the screen here and press it and it just gives you all the dimensions. The steering's really quite precise for a car of this size. Um, it took me by surprise. Um, it's pleasant, it's neat and it's quite quick. The brake pedal and the throttle pedal are very, very sensitive. Like the brake travel is, pedal travels hardly anything. So it's sharp um, and the throttle is nippy. Like if you're used to a bit of lag in a modern diesel where they've tried to calibrate it for extra economy, this is not that. This is way, way sharper and more urgent, which I and especially my, my wife, Chops, really like. She doesn't like that, that laggy kind of laziness that a lot of eco diesels have got. There's a grouse in the road. Grouse in the road, grouse in the road, grouse in the road. Okay, quiet bit of road, and I'm gonna do a zero to 62, because this has a dual personality, the, the FEV. Uh, zero to 62 in 5.6 seconds. Three, two, one. Whoa! <laughs> it's just, there you go. I mean, isn't that weird, the sound? It suddenly goes from being dead quiet to being really angry and quite raw, above about three and a half, four thousand. I've got about 45 minutes more to drive. I'm not gonna put all that on camera. I believe the kids on TikTok do something like this and we can just cut to that scene. Here we go, V8 Defender. And boom, back in the room. Same car, but different heart. This is the V8. As I weave my way really subtly in a V8, 518 horsepower, um, tall building through the town of Warwick, let's talk about this then. First and foremost, I'm driving the short wheelbase, the 90, the two door, four, three door, whatever you want to call it. But you can't buy the Fev in that, I know. 
everything I'm looking at is fundamentally the same apart from these. These metal paddle shifters. The V8 uses the same uh, ZF 8-speed gearbox that's been in quite a few um, modern JLR cars. It's a great gearbox. But they've sharpened the software for sort of crisper, more sporty shifts. And that means you can manually smash it through the gears with these paddles here. Still an auto, you can't buy it as a manual. It's the most powerful Defender ever made. It's the fastest. It's a 150 mile an hour car and it weighs over two and a half tons. Apparently they've increased the whine of the supercharger. I haven't heard it yet, but I'm sure I, I will. Linked to the eight speed ZF gearbox, the same gearbox in all the other Defenders. And you know, it's still got all the other Defender-ish things if you did ever want to take this 100 grand upwards car off-road. So yeah, it'll still have the terrain response, the locking diffs, the low range gear ratios, the adjustable height, the decent approach and departure angles. It still wades to 900 millimeters if you really wanted to, or you could just stick it in automatic and it will do everything on any surface, which is kind of the Land Rover hallmark. But what makes it special apart from that engine? Okay, let's start down here. The Defender V8 comes with 22 inch wheels as standard. They are massive. I actually, I actually like these alloys. They are so simple, but I think that works for the Defender shape. I don't like the cluttered wheels. I'm quite funny like that. This is shod with 27545 um, Continental Cross Contact RXs. So it's more of a road focused tire, really. Um, huge, but you can option it with 20 inch wheels. If you option it with the 20 inch wheels, it actually affects the top speed. Top speed is brought down from 149 miles an hour to 119. Not that I'd be particularly bothered. Um, behind that, you've got gigantic disc brakes. Um, and then you've got the Brembo calipers here, which are painted in the sort of electric blue color. Now I did, I did read that you can option the calipers in white, black, or gray, if you wanted, if you didn't like the blue. It's a funny car, the short wheelbase. I'm not going to dwell on the short wheelbase-ness because that's not really the nature of this, uh, this review, but it does feel so comically st stubby. It's very, very broad, but short. There aren't many other cars like this because you can't buy the G-Wagon anymore as a two-door. You can buy a Land Cruiser as a commercial two-door. That's not really the same realm as this car. Not that you need it when you're driving around a town, but it's full-time four-wheel drive because that's just what Land Rover's USP is. It does have stop-start, which it defaults to, so the V8 um, quietens down and shuts off as many times as it possibly can, which does get quite irritating, I'm not going to lie. Um, this starts at £100,000. So this is the flagship. You know, I was talking about the bookend of the Defender world you got the more pr the most practical version the most you know the most fuel efficient version which is the fev this is the the opposite end to that this is the north american uh arab emirates version really it's a bit of a lollop you get with a defender but it's what you expect because this is not an svr car by that i mean it's not been developed by special vehicle operations the sort of uh extra special uh, skunk works of Land Rover. This is not an SVR, despite the fact it's got, you know, supercharged V8 firepower. So it still has that kind of feel. You do still have some body roll. It does loll up like you'd expect a heavy, high up off-roader to do. But those uh, stiffer anti-roll bars and the, the thicker anti-roll bars, the stiffer bushes, the custom dampers and springs, I think, going to come into play shortly. What you want to know is, like, what does it really drive like when you're being spirited? Because you don't even consider a car like a V8 Defender if you, unless you're going to try and make it sing a bit. And by that I mean, you know, kick it down, push it a little bit. It does amaze me. So 5.1 seconds to 62 in the short wheelbase, 90. And then 5.4 seconds to 62 if you're in the long wheelbase, the 110. Bearing in mind then, and I didn't quite get my calculations right, I don't think. Bearing in mind then, that's a tenth of a second quicker than the long wheelbase FEV. The FEV's 5.6, 5.4. 
5.6 to 60. Under here, I still can't get over that plastic checker plate on the bonnet. I wish it was a delete option, apparently it isn't. I would have to just rip it off. This is the heart of the machine. Now, so yeah, 518 brake horsepower, 461 pounds feet of torque. Bearing in mind the, the, the FEV that I've just been driving, is 404 horsepower, 472, so more torque, but down on horsepower. This is 30 horsepower less than this engine in the recently revised F-Type SVR, which I actually think is a superb car, if you like that kind of car. I'll have a quick look. Because this car, the Defender, has been under development for a good eight years. And apparently, according to Land Rover, they weren't gonna V8 it originally, even though they were running around with some V8 mules. It's really, really set back, the motor, when you look at it compared to the, the strut tops here. It seems to fit in really well. It's not a pretty looking engine. Most engines aren't these days, and I don't even know why I pop the bonnet. I just do it out of pure curiosity. But there we go, like that. But I think the fact remains is this engine's got rich history with Jag Land Rover. We know it's really good. You don't buy this model of car unless you want something interesting to come out from here. But there's a bit of a surprise here, and it's the sound. I'll talk about that around the back. One of the things that fascinates me about the V8 Defender is that you've got that Larry engine in there, but it's actually quite silky and sophisticated because it's been muted. The exhausts, quad exhausts here, actually quite small diameter, actually quite subtly presented. And you'll see because they're so snubby like that, I thought, well, why aren't they celebrating it a bit more? And it's because, apparently, they still want that really good approach and departure angle for off-roading, so it can't stick out too far because it will drag on the ground. It's not a very loud exhaust, either. They have digitally piped a bit of sound into the cabin, and they've, they've increased the supercharger whine, which I, I said about earlier, but it's, it's, it's not an SVR Range Rover. It's not a sort of, doesn't sound bellendery. You know what I mean. The things that matter on a car like this is ignoring the fact that the engine is a ridiculous idea to put this engine in this car in in 2021 ignore that for a second let's focus on like whether it's been well engineered in the past if you drove a an amg g-wagon you know a g63 the old the older shape it just felt like they were throwing a firework onto an old plow it just couldn't handle it. And some people like that. I just think it, in this instance, it's, in this genre of car, it's pointless. I'm now trying to work out whether this, you know, this is an, an all new car, remember? Let's go round this roundabout a couple of times. I've got road derived tires on it. As soon as you go into a corner quite hard, you are reminded of the fact, yeah, it is a heavy thing. But, It's hanging on and that torque delivery, that power delivery is very, very, do you know what, it's smooth. I'm gonna drive down there to Hazley Knob. It is surprisingly, I'm gonna say this, it's actually, it is surprisingly quiet. I'm gonna wind the window down. All right, it's louder out there. It's just quite a quiet cabin go through a village so I don't want to drive like a complete bell even though I'm driving through a place called Hazley Knob. Okay a little bit of 0 to 60 shall we? Okay three two one <laughs> oh my <me> water bottle <laughs> so there we go <coughs> It shouldn't really do that. It, it feels very much at odds with the, the mantra, the, uh, the, the, the lifestyle of a Defender, but I guess this is the flagship car. This is the one that's got the, you know, the big pistons. This is the one that's, that would really go. And on the one hand, this is a really good value G-Wagon, cheaper than the, uh, well, about the same price as the cheapest G-Wag, um, certainly 
what, £60,000 cheaper than the AMG version of the G-Wag? And yet, you can just tool around in it like this. Obviously, it's exactly the same body style um, as the FEV that we've just seen. Because this is the short wheelbase, the 90, that's the boot that you're greeted with. However, if you buy it as the 110, the V8 has the regular flat entry boot, which is 1,075 litres, as opposed to the FEV, which has that raised lip, as you saw, which is 853 litres. That makes me feel slightly better about the Jimny that I own, which really doesn't have a boot. This is a big car with a really quite a small boot. Now remember, the FEV can only tow three tonnes. This tows three and a half, like normal Defenders. You can probably hear it because I've got the door open. But just in case people had no idea that you were driving the V8, there are illuminated tread boards when you get in which say V8, surprisingly. The cabin of the V8 is actually pretty much the same as all Defenders. There's a couple of minor differences which you wouldn't probably notice at first. For example, I'm pretty sure, yeah, that's a full Alcantara steering wheel and the metal parts are, are murdered out on this particular version. And I have to say, the buttons, I've been exploring them more on this car than the, than the FEV. Really, really nice uh, buttons on there. You can choose between, I think, um, suede and leather seats, or this has the robust tech material, the same as the FEV, with Alcantara that's perforated. I have tried the heated seats because the weather's just suddenly got a bit angry with us and the heated seats are amazing. Almost feels like there's a big fan in there. But yeah, everything else, you're not met with a V8 badge here. It just says Defender across that, that structural part of the dash, which Land Rover like to talk about with the handles. You're not met with anything else. So on the one hand, it's a tasteful dash. I like it. Lots of people like it. It's not cluttered. Infotainment is, is, is nice. You've got the optional curved screen, 11.4 inch. The standard is 10 inch. But I feel like it should have maybe had a few more little trinkets because of that extra money that you're paying. That's just me. Okay, this is the real world getting in the back of a Defender 90. Lever, pull the seat forward. Sadly, it's not fully manual. You then have to press a button on the side to electrically move it forward. And that takes this long. So you can imagine if it's raining or your children like mine are quite impatient, that's quite boring. And then you get in the back. But once you're in the back, I'll put this back because it was where my, uh, It's a bit weird, it should go back surely to where it was. You've got the infotainment um, input in the back of the seat, which I like, and the, the charger port, that's cool. Loads of headroom, and this that sort of stadium seating, this seat is higher than those. And I have got quite a bit of room. Not significantly more than my Jimny, it must be said. So how do I wrap up this review? The first thing I've got to point out is if you don't value the, the buying into the Land Rover lifestyle, then all of the Defenders really come across as being quite expensive. But I think they've done a great job with these two cars. And these are, after all, poles apart. The plug-in hybrid and the V8 petrol, they bookend the Defender family, which is what this review is about. This car, starting at a hundred grand is only really going to be for collectors in this kind of country like Britain I think or people in the Arab Emirates and North America where petrol's really not a problem. I think that this car is not worth the huge amount more compared to its plug-in hybrid peer. I think they've almost made the plug-in hybrid too good and if you're looking at a car like this you never normally consider buying the plug-in. Try it first you might be impressed. But what I would say, as I think it's a little bit of a shame that the plug-in hybrid can't go a little bit further EV only, and I'm sure that a revised version will be around the corner. So my vote goes with the FEV, possibly predictably. Anyway, I hope you've enjoyed this review of the Defender. I'm Johnny Smith, this has been The Late Break Show. I really welcome your comments below. 
These brand new launch episodes are sponsored proudly by Continental Tires, and this car is wearing Continental Tires.